Sarah, over to you. Good morning, colleagues. Um, welcome this morning to this important uh, session of the Integrated Policy Practitioners Network. I think we're waiting for some colleagues to enter the waiting room, so we'll start in, in just 60 seconds, if you can just stand by, and we'll start very shortly. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, my name is Sarah Ratri from UNDP, and uh, I'm uh, delighted to welcome everyone to this, this ninth IPPN Knowledge Cafe. Uh, the Integrated Policy Practitioners Network is an initiative of 10 founding UN entities. Uh, it's really to create a community, a community space where we can really talk about lessons learned and experiences and uh, strengthen our collective capacities to apply integrated policy approaches in, in really concrete and practical ways in support of the 2030 agenda. So this is an open uh, forum. It's open to colleagues in government and academia and to the broader development community. And it's jointly managed by UNDP, UNICEF, ILO and the FAO. Uh, IPPN holds a series of these monthly knowledge cafes to showcase these insightful experiences of policy integration. And today I'm really delighted that we're going to focus on the support provided by the UN system to member states as they work to integrate human rights into their voluntary national reviews. So as outlined in the Secretary General's call to action for human rights, we really need collective UN action uh, to support member states to put rights at the center of sustainable development. Promoting rights-based reporting on the SDGs through the voluntary national review processes is one really practical and catalytic way the UN system can answer this call. Integrating human rights data and approaches in VNRs can not only help to strengthen the quality of reports, but it also reduces report, reporting burdens, accelerates implementation towards achieving both development and human rights outcomes. Uh, so co-organized by a number of UN entities, um, UNDP, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, ILO, DCO and UN Women, this Knowledge Cafe over the IPPN seeks to, to really speak to a really key tool, which is about the use of this a guidance note on a common operational approach to human rights in VNRs. And more and importantly, to stimulate discussion around the different opportunities we see for UN support to member states in developing rights-based VNRs. Uh, and that means VNRs that are both developed through a human rights-based approach in terms of their process and that incorporate human rights data and information in their substance. So we're gonna to today take a really brief look at the contents of the guidance. Um, you're gonna hear about that from my colleague, Maria Soledad. And then we'll hear about really concrete experiences of developing these rights-based VNRs um, in Guinea-Bissau and the Andes and Palestine. And we'll have time for an open discussion and a question and answer with the speakers. Um, just a little piece of housekeeping, please make sure your microphones are muted to allow colleagues to hear the presenters and panelists. Um, please use the chat function actively to ask any questions, share your experiences or insights throughout the session. So uh, we're excited to share with you the guidance. Uh, if somebody can put the link to, directly to it in the chat, that would be appreciated. This is a new practical tool that was launched at the HLPF uh, this year uh, on the margins of the HLPF to support member states to integrate human rights into the development of VNRs. And it was an interagency effort, uh, jointly led by UNDP and OHCHR, but really a broad interagency effort with contributions from across the system uh, through the Call to Action for Human Rights Working Group. And it was supported by the Human Rights Mainstreaming Fund. And it's really part of an effort to bring human rights and SDG systems closer together. And, um, at this point, I'd just like to launch a quick poll amongst the colleagues who are joining us, um, which will come up on your screen. And it's, uh, it's really asking the question just for your knowledge and, and to, to make you think a little bit about the integration of human rights and SDGs, about what percentage of the SDG indicators and targets correspond to international human or labor rights. So that should be coming up and please, please click your answer and we'll get the, the feedback from that in a moment. Um, the guidance, um, just before I hand over to my colleague from OHCHR, it was developed to support member states and to take advantage of the synergies between human rights and SDG processes 
It is a complementary resource to the DESA handbook for preparation of VNRs and the UN, uh, the SG's uh, VNR guidelines, which is, um, you know, are important resources for member states. And it highlights a lot of really important entry points. And it, this complementary guidance really provides uh, resources and examples. It's very practical and, and with specific step-by-step -step guidance. So before handing over to Maria Soledad, I'm wondering, do we have the results of the poll? Yes, we do, 55%. Um, uh, 20, sorry, 29% of participants um, are of the view that 55% of the SDG indicators and targets correspond to international human rights or labor rights. And uh, 57% of the participants think it's 92% and 14% think it's 100%. 92% uh, is the answer. 92% of the SDG targets and indicators correspond with countries' human rights obligations um, in relation to the international framework. So that really shows the, the, the great complementarity between, between the frameworks and congratulations to everyone who got it correct and thanks for participating. Um, everyone else, I'll hand over to um, Maria Soledad now from, from the UN Human Rights Office. Thank you, Maria Soledad. Thank you very much, Sarah. Can everybody hear me and see me? Yes? Yes. So, so the next slide, please, if we can project it. We have established that human rights can strengthen BNRs through their preparation, presentation, and follow up. And what is the content of the guidance and how does it help to integrate human rights into the BNRs? This guidance provides an overview of the human rights system and the complementarity and entry points that exist in BNR processes. And it explains what existing reports and complementary reporting requirements and data are likely to exist and how to coordinate better between government bodies working on human rights and those working on development. The guidance highlights the wealth of information, particularly on populations being left behind, that is available through human rights mechanisms, including its recommendations, as well as information gathered by states, stakeholders, and populations to engage with human rights mechanisms, such as the UPR. The guidance also elaborates on the importance of human rights-based approaches to leaving no one behind, collection and analysis of data, meaningful participation of stakeholders, and how to engage human rights actors in BNR preparation and follow-up. Suggestions on how and where attention to human rights can strengthen BNR processes and the different elements to consider are included. And more importantly, these suggestions and insights are drawn from a review of BNRs submitted by member states to date and builds on these good practices. Please, next slide. Very concretely, this guidance proposes an eight-step formula to develop BNRs that integrate human rights. The steps are meant to accompany member states throughout the full life cycle of BNRs, from preparation and planning up until uh, presenting it to the high-level political forum. The BNR handbook describes the process of preparing the BNRs through four stages, preparation and organization, stakeholder engagement, BNR preparation and high level political forum presentation. And how do these eight steps relate to the four stages of the BNR handbook? For that, we have included a reference color coding that illustrates how the four stages of the BNR handbook relate to the eight steps in the guidance. And what the guidance basically does is to break down these stages further to identify the various entry points for human rights in each part of the process providing a practical checklist to guide member states through the eight steps, which are one, preparation and planning, two, stakeholder analysis and engagement, three, data collection, four, data analysis, five, drafting the report, six, multi-stakeholder validation, seven, presentation at the high-level political forum, and eight, follow-up after. Please, the next. As mentioned, the guidance includes examples of how countries have integrated human rights and BNR processes across a range of contexts. And I would like to briefly mention these three. Costa Rica has made a considerable effort to integrate recommendations from the UPR into SDG implementation. In its UPR review in 2019, Costa Rica received 212 recommendations and fully accepted 194. All, hundred, all 212 were matched against existing targets and indicators for the SDGs, 
and use the data to inform national development plans and priorities. And Dominican Republic is an example worth highlighting as it is the result of UN support through the call to action and it's centered in promoting the use of UPR recommendations, calling to strengthen its follow-up tool for human rights recommendations and its alignment to the 2030 agenda. In the BNR's report from 2021, the Dominican Republic described how the country committed to implementing the SDGs with a human rights perspective by establishing mechanisms to link them both. And lastly, in Mongolia, local researchers develop a methodology to identify categories of people likely to be at risk of being left behind under each SDG. And then they convene focus groups among these six population groups that they had been identified to verify the findings and including their views in the VNR report. There are many more interesting and insightful examples in the guidance note, and we'll get to hear firsthand uh, from the colleagues uh, that will speak later. And to finalize, please, next slide. The guidance in its English version is available online. We would appreciate your support in disseminating it to your networks and colleagues. You will see it included in the next BNR handbook, the SDG Knowledge Hub, the BNR platform. It is currently being translated into French and Spanish. We really look forward to seeing how colleagues make use of the guidance, which is, as Sarah mentioned at the beginning, the result of an interagency effort through the call to action. Please do share any feedback you may have with us, and we would like to continue this exchange of experiences. And now I would like to give the floor to VCO to welcome our distinguished speakers. Thank you very much. George, over to you. Yeah, can you hear me, colleagues? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, really. Yeah, thank you, really, very much, Maria Solidad and Sarah, for the introduction. A great, great pleasure to be with you. My name is George Abusuluf. I'm the Senior Human Rights Advisor with uh, DCO uh, in, in New York. And uh, so happy to facilitate uh, the uh, interactive discussion uh, today with all of you. Actually, yeah. Uh, the biggest question, how you uh, can support member states on integrating uh, the human rights into the development of the voluntary national reviews. This is what we are going to listen to the using the great tool that really was developed and just presented by my colleagues uh, uh, on the human rights and the voluntary national reviews. This tool is developed to help you uh, member states to uh, to uh, to strengthen the human rights based uh, approach as articulated in the secretary general's call to action uh, on human rights <clears throat> sorry so uh, we hope that through this uh, session we'll be able to identify some practical ways on how the un even can improve and strengthen its support uh, to member uh, states uh, in this uh, regard. We have actually three distinguished guests to speak uh, today. Uh, they will have uh, five minutes to, uh, to present. And after that, you hope you'll have around 30 minutes of interactive discussion uh, with the participants. The speakers are uh, Mr. Uh, Agostino Moses, who is the head of the Department for External Policies, Monitoring and Evaluation, Minister of Economy, Planning and Regional Integration in Guinea-Bissau. So Wilgam Agostino, and we have uh, Maria Laura Fino, who is the, from uh, uh, International Labor Standards Specialist, ILO, and her work focusing on dec decent work uh, at the Office of the uh, Andean Countries uh, with ILO in Peru. And finally, we will end with uh, Inas Margi, who is the program coordinator for you and women in Palestine. So without any further delay, I would like to welcome Agustino. You have the floor for five minutes, please. Go ahead. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Right. So what we know from the uh, 
and what is the uh, what is the context of the now, and also what is the technology that we have in the process, and uh, what we want from the that means also Agostino, just one second. We have a, a little trouble hearing you. Would it be possible to adjust your microphone, please? Okay. I don't know if you are really well now. This is much better. Yes. Try to speak a bit closer to your screen, please. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. As I'm saying, I'm. Uh, uh, I would like to talk about the three points. So that means uh, the first one is the context of the Guinea Bissau. The second one is the methodology that we use for our integration, the human rights in our DNA process. And then the, the last one is uh, what is the upcoming event that we have for this uh, process uh, about the DNA in Guinea Bissau. The first thing about the context, uh, the Guinea Bissau is a multi party republic. The context is a uh, uh, protecting the political impact uh, controlled by the smooth uh, period. That means the uh, state of Guinea Bissau as a part of the Council of the Nations that tried most of the United Nations study uh, on human rights, namely the past international of the economy, social and cultural rights, and the past of international on civil and the political rights, which included both of the obligations, equality and the non discrimination. The country is experience of the constitution is now carried out in the context of the preparation of the national review support for the review that means DNR as a very particular participatory process that allows the sole conclusion of the actual state of the institution of the SDG. And uh, the DNR uh, is not only seen like uh, as a support but also as a process. An uh, open, transparent process including the participation of the various stakeholders, including civil society organizations, the private sector, the media, human, and the youth, uh, people, doctors, and other uh, more vulnerable groups. That's, uh, I can say, a regional consultation was held in nine regions of, of the country. Including the Qatar Bissau. The consultation was held as uh, providing a space for the various stakeholders to express their views on the level of the implementation of the SDG, never the between rights holders and the holders of the obligation to build the consensus, to build the consensus of the SDG, uh, consensus on the country's situation in terms of the implementation of any study agenda. The regional consultation allow a, a, a dialogue on only between central and regional states and countries, and between, but also between them and the local population, especially those left behind. The methodology, as I said, the methodology used to uh, allow the giving voice to the most vulnerable people as, as well as identifying the gaps and implementation of the SDG, that is, uh, what remains to, uh, to be done. Define a data collection to strategy to measure the data at the state of implementation of the uh, training and study agenda, focusing on the uh, bridging the gap uh, identified in a statistic country official. Organizations, uh, organizations of the group discussion with key efforts, uh, with key efforts and the uh, target uh, populations at regional level, at the regional level, the obtaining of the primary data through the group discussion with the representatives of the organizations involved in the implementation. Thank you. Over to you, George. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, really, uh, uh, Agostino. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the quality of the voice wasn't always helpful, but uh, we would appreciate if you can uh, send or share with the participants uh, your uh, presentation and your uh, experience uh, that you just shared in Guinea-Bissau, and maybe during the interactive discussion, we'll give also further colleagues uh, uh, from uh, Guinea-Bissau to present uh, uh, also uh, and comment uh, uh, 
uh, on your uh, presentation. So without any further delay, I would like now uh, to give the floor to uh, Maria Laura Fino from the International Labor Standards, uh, uh, International, International Labor Standards Specialist, ILO uh, in the Peru. So Maria Laura, you have the floor. Thank you, George. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for the invitation to join the IPPN Knowledge Cafe to learn about human rights, how can human rights strengthen the BNR processes. ILO has been part of the, the elaboration of the guide, so it is particularly, uh, um, uh, we, I am particularly happy to represent the International Labor Organization in this, in this event and to share the experience from the Andean countries. Indeed, I am uh, now connecting from uh, Quito, Ecuador. Um, the, um, so far, we have worked in uh, several Andean countries. Uh, in the process of developing their cooperation frameworks. And I would like to share the experience in particular of Ecuador, uh, which is the most uh, recent cooperation framework that has been signed just one month ago on the 15th of, of August. Um, the cooperation uh, framework in Ecuador was uh, based on four inputs that were uh, developed. Um, that the, of course the national uh, development plan for uh, for uh, for Ecuador, uh, the evaluation of the previous uh, cooperation framework, um, the country uh, assessment, and consultations with stakeholders. Indeed, I would like to reiterate one point that Agustinio uh, made before me on the importance of consultations with key stakeholders as a, an, an essential part of the elaboration of the uh, cooperation framework and possibly uh, the, um, also the voluntary, voluntary national reviews. Um, the, obviously, the, the, as it always happens, the cooperation framework in Ecuador focused on the most important challenges and opportunities at the national level, and it was extremely important to hear from um, the civil society and for uh, what is of our interest in particular at the ILO uh, from our constituents, which is to say the employers and workers organization, organizations that participated very actively in several meetings that were organized um, in, in order to um, build the, the cooperation framework. Uh, so this is one uh, point in particular that I would like to stress, the importance of consultations with civil society, including employers and workers organizations, with, uh, which are our constituents at the ILO. This is an extremely um, important point, and it's something that uh, it's a methodology that has proven success, successful in the case of Ecuador, and hopefully could be replicated in the context of supporting uh, right-based uh, voluntary national reviews. The second point that I would like to make, make is about the importance of considering um, uh, in, the, in taking into account uh, human rights, uh, labor rights, and uh, also the um, uh, comments of the supervisory bodies of the ILO. Uh, this is uh, something that has been taken into account also greatly uh, in the recent uh, uh, cooperation framework with, uh, with Ecuador, uh, in which even um, the, the, the comments that were reflected were of two kinds. Uh, first, the comments of the um, Committee of Experts on the application of standards and recommendations of, uh, sorry, the, the Committee of Experts on the application of conventions and recommendations of the ILO, as well as the Committee on the application of standards of the International Labour Conference. Both type of comments were indeed taken into account in the building of the cooperation uh, framework. 
uh, and these uh, help in the in the uh, in the common goal of um, building a, a right based um, a cooperation framework. But hopefully, this methodology, as I was saying with my previous po point on the consultation, can also be replicated when it when it comes to uh, labor rights and the recommendations of the supervisory body uh, in the context of the voluntary national reviews. So, um, George, I think I will uh, stop it here, uh, abiding to the five minutes that were given to me, and thanking you all again for your participation in this event and for the invitation uh, for the ILO. Thank you really so much, Maria Laura. You highlighted uh, key and very important uh, elements, uh, including engagement and consultation with civil society and, uh, and incorporating labor rights as a human uh, rights in cooperation framework, but we all know that the whole uh, process uh, from the development of cooperation frameworks uh, through engagement with the VNRs, it's all has to be human rights based and all co complementing each other. So it's a whole uh, comprehensive process and you and contribution to the whole process including the VNR is really very crucial and essential. So uh, hopefully we can discuss further during uh, our uh, discussion, but let me uh, now uh, give the floor to uh, Inas, uh, the program coordinator of UN Women in Palestine. Inas, you have the floor, please. Thank you so much, George. And I would like to thank you for this uh, opportunity to present a practical experience from Palestine. Um, actually, um, what colleagues have mentioned uh, earlier about participation and the importance of engagement of people themselves and of representatives uh, from civil society and others is at the heart of what I would like to present today. Uh, Palestine actually submitted its first DNR to the High Level Political Forum in 2018. The next one is planned to be submitted in 2024. It actually uh, goes beyond the five years uh, review cycle. However, the logic for that is that Palestine is currently preparing its cooperation framework. And the next national plan, the start uh, for the preparation of this plan, will take place in 2023. So, in fact, the lessons learned for the preparation of the first DNR will be very handy, and they are already uh, being taken stock of in the preparation of the next uh, plan, as well as the cooperation. What UN Women uh, has done in the context of Palestine, with launching the DNR preparation, we partnered with the Palestinian government through the lead of the SDG architecture, the Prime Minister's office. And I wish to highlight that our colleague from the Prime Minister's office, the National Coordinator, wanted to be with us today, but he apologized to travel. What we have done uh, at that stage is that we thought how to ensure the integration of the needs, priorities, and rights of the furthest left behind groups of women and girls across the occupied Palestinian territory in the different uh, uh, stages of the review process. And what we have embarked on at that point is organizing or setting up an ongoing dialogue space between representatives of the government, mainly of the women machinery, the statistical bureau, and the prime minister's office, with representatives of furthest left behind groups of women and girls. And this space actually brought together the government officials directly with the representatives of uh, furthest left behind groups of women and girls. And it highlighted gaps at different levels, whether in terms of the data or the services, as well as the policies that should be in place that are planned. The review enabled uh, also engaging academia with the Central uh, Bureau of Statistics, which usually this connection is not very much established, mainly in the context of Palestine, because the academia produces research and analysis, and the Statistical Bureau produces statistics. However, linkages between the different types of data and information was not made, so this space also enabled the engagement of the different stakeholders. As a result of this process, civil society representatives embarked on preparing a shadow report on the DNR, which on its own was very important. UN Women supported as well this process. And this report also was used for later advocacy and policy uh, change. 
strange. It also was very handy and helpful to the society frame their demand in the framework of the SDGs. In terms of the best practices, what we have uh, actually realized as part of this uh, process that the aim of the review was initially to identify data gaps in relation, in relation to the SDGs uh, gender indicators and to provide an analytical space with the aim to support formulating recommendations in line with international frameworks. And this was very important in terms of linking the different frameworks, such as the Convention uh, on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination, the Beijing Declaration, the UN Women Global Campaign Generation Equality Forum and the different action coalitions, etc. In addition to that, establishing the ongoing dialogue between the government and the representatives ensured that no one is left behind in national planning and in the sustainable development efforts, mainly the groups that are usually far from national planning, such as Bedouin women, uh, herder communities, uh, communities that are um, uh, fragmented due to the ongoing etc. Adopting a people-centered approach, also where field-level dialogues were organized in remote and marginalized locations, means that the agenda is relevant in the, in the marginalized location. It is not only done at the central level where the ministries are existing and operating, but also at the field level where services are sparse. And finally, ensuring that the voices, sorry, that's my timer, ensuring that the voices of the furthest left behind groups uh, was also central in formulating global best practices, in addition to the very rich and informative guidance that was also brought up today. You and women developed a guidance known on the preparation of gender responsive UNRs, which took the field experience in Palestine and, of course, other countries uh, in, the, in the region and globally, ensured implementing a bottom-up strategic approach to the development of UNRs and guidance as, as such. Of course, not without challenges and not without uh, learning. One of the key takeaways uh, that we have learned through this process is that the, the lack of gender data and availability of analysis on further steps behind groups is essential in ensuring development of gender sensitive DNR. We still need to find more data and to produce more data uh, on further steps behind groups in order to tailor the reviews and the later recommendations. Strengthening the linkages with normative frameworks is also essential. There is a variety of uh, reference points. Sometimes it can be uh, confusing at the field level. However, where data could be cross-referenced, that uh, could be used and uh, could be very, very helpful. Uh, coming up with new and innovative ways of working, focusing on people-centered agenda, engaging communities, which was also mentioned, mentioned by uh, other uh, uh, respective presenters, is also essential. And finally, creating spaces for dialogue among stakeholders and following up on the DNR, not only producing the report as an objective on its own, but also looking at the follow up, looking at the importance of formulating the recommendations that could be used later on for policy and advocacy. I want to end by adding how the importance of raising the voices of women and girls that are further step behind can be central also to the implementation of the sustainable development agenda. Currently, we are in the process of developing a field report uh, that uh, went actually to women in remote locations and asked them about their knowledge of the sustainable development agenda of the BNRs and if they have any messages. And what we found out is that the messages were in the heart of the agenda and they were related directly to the goals. And I want to also uh, highlight that we took those uh, messages into development of social media cards that would be an essential part of the preparation and the review of the planning teams of the next uh, planning cycle at the level of Palestine. And here is an example of one of the cards that were developed and are still to be used, where Ruwaita uh, Rebaidi from Masafir Yatta from Hebron area, uh, an area that lacks a lot of the services, described her challenge and said, our suffering is great. We have no water, no electricity, no transportation, and this is the duty of the government to provide us with it as citizens. These are priorities and fundamentals, and we suffer from the harassment of the occupation and the sector. We must buy our own water at our own expense from Hebron, and yet they fire at the pan to empty the water. 
I cannot think of any stronger message to go to duty bearers, to go to government officials, to translate it into the implementation of a sustainable agenda. Thank you so much, and back at you, George. Thanks, thanks so much, really, Inas, and really, slow, uh, you uh, have uh, excellent uh, experience and good practices that you just shared, especially on uh, multi-stakeholders dialogue, uh, focusing on the furthest left behind of women and girls, involving academic institutions, uh, civil society organizations, in preparing also uh, supporting their role in presenting a shadow report to the VNR. We know that there are just very few cases where we saw a civil society submission of shadow reports, highlighting the data gaps and how to use this as a strategic opportunity for improvement on the realization of the SDGs. Uh, uh, voices of those who are left behind, who are more marginalized, to be heard and using the social media as an excellent tool to reach uh, people. Despite all the challenges and might be some shrinking of civic space uh, in Palestine, but I'm sure you made a, a great contribution of it. Uh, ensuring that women's rights and uh, women's active participation and the right to be heard uh, is uh, uh, at all uh, levels. Thank you so much, Ina. So without any delay, we'll have <clears throat> less than uh, 30 or maybe 25 minutes for uh, the discussion. So uh, before opening the floor, I would like uh, to highlight that uh, all uh, uh, presenters, please try to be very brief, maximum one minute. Uh, if you have any questions to any of the speakers, if we would like to share your experience on integration, human rights and the VNR, please let us know and share, share it uh, with the group. You can also share links on the chat boxes of any resources. What are your own challenges that you faced in adopting a rights-based approach to VNRs, uh, uh, and what are other opportunities besides what has been mentioned to support member states uh, in fulfilling their uh, obligations in adopting a rights-based approach to VNRs. But before uh, uh, giving the floor uh, to, uh, to the uh, speakers, please make sure to raise your hand. I'd like to start with Lisa Da Costa, as I mentioned earlier, our senior human rights advisor at the RCO office in Guinea Bissau. If she's there, mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to... Mm -hmm. sorry, yeah, ma, uh, Lisa, are you there with us to comment uh, to the uh, first presentation, uh, uh, please? I am, I am. Can you hear me, George? Yes, I will hear you very, very well. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, George. Thank you uh, to the colleagues organizing this event. Thank you to our uh, uh, speakers. Um, I'm not going to connect my video camera. I'm uh, in a very remote area of Guinea-Bissau with a very unstable uh, internet connection. Um, I will, yes, like to make a few comments uh, based on what uh, I've uh, called here so far. Um, one is that the process is as important, or are they to say, um, more even important than the final product that we call the VNR report. And it's a great opportunity for a reality check with all stakeholders. Um, I think one of the challenge from the perspective of a human rights practitioner is to engage with non-traditional human rights actors, such as Ministry of Economy, Planning and, and Regional Integration. And I have also observed um, that uh, civil society can also be divided between development and human rights NGOs. And that is so um, 
uh, can be a challenge uh, here I, I that it's and the process with all stakeholders in the room and to do it on time if we really want to leverage the multiple opportunities that the VNR offers um, uh, offers um, if you allow me uh, so a few uh, words on the UN I think VNR should be very high on the UN um, UN city agenda, so it should not be left to the individual agencies like you know UNDP to support drafting of the report or WHR or UN Women to support participation of of of, of stakeholders. And the VNR report, uh, when it came out, uh, I, I I told a few colleagues it's not only a self assessment by the state. It's also an invitation for all of us, UN and other partners, to reflect and engage with states. And, you, and the UN is in a particularly good position to facilitate the broader engagement with other development partners. And if there are no existing ones, Unfortunately, the quality of voice is occasion to react um, offers us an opportunity to yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Now it's better. Go. Unfortunately. Lisa, we can't hear you at all. Sorry, colleagues, but it seems we lost the connection with Lisa, but I think she made a really very important. I was saying that the VNR is the next integration. In Guinea-Bissau now, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Hear me? Yes, now is better, now is better, but please try to conclude so that we can give more time for uh, other participants, please. Can you hear me? I, I, yes. Okay, um, um, just to say uh, the note on the role that the UN can play, DNR offers for SDG integration to help us priority catalytic effect on the full implementation of Sorry, sorry. I really want to apologize. Uh, we can't, uh, we can't hear you at all. So it's better maybe to to sh to move on with the questions and the discussions. Maybe in a later on, if uh, there will be more a bit be time, we can get back to your point. But yeah, as I said earlier, you raised already a very important point related to the whole process and engagement and consultation as this will be always helpful in, uh, in de deriving lessons learned and recommendations in the whole process for improving uh, the work and you raise also the work the importance of UN strengthening role of the UN as a whole as a system on the whole uh, process. There is a question uh, from the floor related on uh, uh, what are the new guidelines bringing a new integrating and human rights with the VNR uh, that wasn't included the VNR guidelines. So maybe uh, Sarah or uh, Maria Soledad uh, can comment uh, on this question, please. Thanks so much, George. It's a great question, colleagues. Um, as I think we mentioned, 
this guideline should be seen to be complementary, a complement to the DESA handbook uh, for member states. So it should be an accompaniment to that handbook. And the handbook itself mentions human rights, it mentions human rights systems, it mentions national human rights institutions, international obligations, and, and uh, utilizing human rights reporting. So it has some, some mentions, certainly, of course, of the importance of integrating human rights, but the handbook itself doesn't unpack what that means, what that means practically. Um, and that's what this guidance seeks to do. So it talks about, you know, what we talked about at the beginning of the session, that 92% of human rights obligations of states and SDGs correspond. It talks about the types of reporting that states do for their human rights obligations and how that can be used for, for VNRs. Uh, so that whole complementary piece and how to leverage those synergies for efficiency for governments um, and for partners and stakeholders. Um, it, it really goes into detail about the human rights aspects of leaving no one behind and data. And it has uh, it talks about how to engage human rights stakeholders and national human rights systems. And it gives a breakdown of what that looks like. Uh, very importantly as well, it's got over 20 examples from existing VNRs, VNRs that have, you know, have been have been reviewed uh, and it points to those examples. So I think for member states, they can have a look at those other existing examples and that's really useful. And then as Maria Soledad highlighted, it then breaks down these steps, these eight steps in line with the VNR handbook steps. And it, there's a checklist, it's a practical checklist. You can, you can tick it online, you can, you, know, you can use it as an online source. And next to each of the steps, there are links to the relevant resources and to further information that you need. So it really seeks to unpack what is part of the current DESA guidance in a much more practical way based on country experience as an example. So we hope that that's what this brings. The question was asking, how is this going beyond what's in the DESA handbook? So we hope that's what it's bringing and assisting uh, partners with. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, sir. Let's hear to uh, Bonnie Berry, please. Hi, thank you so much for giving me the floor and um, many thanks to all the UN organizations on the call and for organizing this and the development of the handbook. Um, my name is Bonnie. I work for Save the Children in New York at the Global Advocacy Office where I focus on children and the SDGs. Um, I just wanted to say like this is a, a very great resource. I'm very um, excited to look through it um, and welcome the UN uh, support to governments to um, ensure that human rights reporting is integrated into the SDG um, reporting that they do through the VNRs. Um, I had a few questions um, in response to the presentation, and I also wanted to flag a resource that SAVE recently um, published at the High Level Political Forum. Um, but first, for, for questions, um, CSOs on the ground have um, significant resource challenges to um, developing or consult, going out and consulting some of these groups that are at most risk for being left behind um, to support um, that feeding into the VNR processes. Um, so I wanted to know um, what what is the UN doing to better support CSOs to gather the input from communities across the country to ensure that the views of um, groups that are most at risk are being fed into um, the wider uh, consultations? Um, and how um, is the UN thinking about um, or what guidance is available now or plans for the future for um, providing more uh, instructions or guidance on how um, governments, CSOs, or UN agencies can consult with children and child-led groups because, um, of course, you know, there are additional steps that need to be taken, safeguarding measures, whatnot, to, um, to appropriately consult with those groups. But um, children, of course, are recognized by the 2030 Agenda as agents of change. Their views um, are very uh, much important for this. And of course, children are one of the most vulnerable groups and, uh, you know, particularly impacted by the pandemic and, and are at quite severe risk of being left behind because of all of the impacts um, over the last few years. And 
I also I think that one of one of the challenges in addition to the resources is also um, for CSOs doing complementary report or feeding into um, the the consultations for the government report is also just what happens afterwards. What happens to these reports? A lot of CSOs are producing complementary reports, but where do those go? Um, they're not posted on the official website alongside the the government's VNR report. Um, unlike you know in Geneva with the treaty bodies where um, the CSO shadow reports for UPRs are posted. Um, so what can we do to ensure that the reports that are being published um, on uh, along the government reports are also being accessible to the UN, to other member states and other stakeholders so that they can also um, see those and ensure that um, uh. you know all information is being shared. So. Um, I'll put the resource yeah. in the chat box so colleagues can see, but it's um, a how to VNR um, tool guide for um, ensuring that children's rights are advanced through the VNR process. Thanks. Thank you really very much. Uh, let's take uh, another uh, participant before we give give the floor to uh, comments on the questions that were uh, raised. I think there is uh, another hand. Uh, uh, could you help me? Who is the other uh, speaker? Uh, Chelsea, who is the... There was a question from Massimori in the chat. Uh, Massimori, if you would like to come in, uh, please uh, unmute yourself and uh, give your name, your organization, and your country, please. Hey, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Massimori Atisa, and I'm from Ethiopia. I've been practicing uh, different distinguishing conferences, uh, international and national in here in Ethiopia. I am from Model United Nation, Ethiopia. I'm a 17 years old a high school student and I've always been interested in human rights uh, studies and uh, different uh, and different uh, different things regards on the human rights. And uh, the question that, that I want to ask based on uh, the current situation in Ethiopia, the first question that I have is what is the United Nations outlook toward the current civil war between the Ethiopian government in ETPLF in regards of human rights violation. This is my first question. Uh, the second question I have is, I see some impartiality in regards to the investigation carried on by UN on human rights violations of the current war between the Ethiopian government and TPLF. And uh, could you please uh, give me a comment on this? Thank you very much. Thank you really very much. But it's really, uh, yeah, these are excellent and very good questions, uh, but unfortunately, this uh, session is uh, organized to, to talk about the voluntary national uh, reviews, but you can, if you already left your questions uh, on the uh, box, we will be more than happy to refer them to OCHR and maybe in a later stage that they can send you their feedback on the questions that you, uh, you just uh, raised. Now, uh, I would like to ask uh, Inas uh, she, uh, if she can uh, comment on the UN consolidated uh, efforts uh, at the point that was uh, raised uh, earlier by uh, 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 Mar uh, Maria Dasil. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, George. And I want to also uh, comment on this uh, very important uh, question as indeed consolidated efforts by the UN are crucial and necessary in providing complementary support uh, to the government and to the national duty bearers. I wanted to uh, give the example of uh, the, the work done in Palestine, which I think uh, is a very good starting point. As part of the SDG's uh, national architecture, uh, groups were established for each and every goal of the SDGs, bringing together all different stakeholders from the UN, from the government, civil society, traditional actors, and non-traditional actors. In terms of uh, the, group work, the group working on SDG 5, uh, gender equality, there uh, was a several actually uh, UN organizations uh, coming together. Uh, including agencies like the UNESCO, UNICEF, UNFPA, UNDP, UN Women, and others, of course. And they have dialogues with various uh, government institutions. So as an example, the Ministry of Economy was a critical uh, ministry that uh, was engaged 
engage in, in the discussion because the issue of participation and leadership of women in uh, the economic sector is also essential to uh, enhancing women's uh, empowerment and full participation. So this is, of course, an essential element. Uh, of course, there is a way to uh, advance uh, the coordination and consolidation uh, of the work, but it is definitely uh, a very good starting point to have a coordination uh, mechanism. In the preparation of the DNR, of course, the, the example shared focuses on a review from a gender mainstreaming perspective. However, there were uh, parallel reviews from a human rights perspective, disability inclusion, uh, etc. So I, I wanted uh, through this uh, space to really encourage uh, coordination at uh, the different levels, because definitely one agency uh, cannot do it. It should be uh, and should remain a consolidated and uh, a joint effort. Thank you, George. Back at you. Thank you really so much, Inas. I see uh, Khalidja uh, has also a question on the timing. Uh, could you elaborate more, uh, Khalidja, please? Oh, Nilla. George, perhaps yeah. I can I can just say two words. I mean, I just yes. wait and then that. The guide does encourage that this process of integration begins as soon as possible. I mean, no, no time to waste. I mean, the, the, the sooner we begin, the better uh, that we can follow all these uh, eight steps uh, to integrate human rights. Um, so uh, a, a warm uh, encouragement to do this as soon as, uh, as we understand that the, the, the government is going to be preparing for a BNR. Thank you. Also taking into account that one of the difficulties, and I think it was a question as well in the chat, uh, that, that usually happens is that actors working on development don't, do not necessarily speak to the actors that work on human rights. So this coordination usually uh, based on our practices is, um, is what takes more, uh, what is more difficult to overcome. And it's a question of a cultural change. Uh, of uh, government, uh, government, civil servants, uh, et cetera. So the sooner we begin, the better. Thank you. Yeah, on the question uh, related to the UN uh, uh, dialogue, uh, actual, what's the UN doing to help CSOs in their consultations, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, just to update you, all that, uh, you know, the United Nations uh, after, uh, uh, the 75th anniversary, the major strategy that developed by the Secretary General, our common agenda, uh, uh, there was a special focus on enhancing and improving the way how the UN is uh, involving and working with NGOs and civil society organizations, including uh, assigning uh, uh, focal points at country level of civil society focal points. And currently the UN is involved in developing clear strategies at country level on enhancing these consultations at all levels. So their thematic uh, focus of these organizations, their geographic focus, as well as their, you know, from the grassroots and go up. So at all levels, this is gonna be taken and improved. Also, UNICEF is highly engaged also in developing child-friendly versions of most of the key documents and guidelines that are developed by the United Nations to, to ensure active engagement of children, also youth-led organizations. So uh, 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 CSOs will always be uh, at the heart of the whole uh, processes and we hope if there are any recommendations from your side, please uh, share with us and we'll be more than happy to bring it uh, to, uh, to our organizations. Uh, any other questions, colleagues on the chat or anybody would like to make a final comment? We have to close in one, two minutes, please. Sarah, do we have any final, Chelsea, uh, any um, final? I believe, uh, hi, George, I believe Agostino from Guinea-Bissau has a hand raised. It'd be great if his connection is good, if, if we could give him the floor for a moment before closing. 
Thank you so much. Nothing further from UNDP state. Thank you so much, colleagues. Agostino, please, you are muted. Go have the floor. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I just want to highlight the, some questions about the, uh, what I say in the chat. Uh, what is the common challenge, for example, in the security world, uh, about it, what is the capacity that you need? Uh, you need uh, I also can uh, emphasize that uh, in Guinea, for example, what is the common challenge that I think for some many countries have been asked is that we have a, a budget allocated budget for the human rights. This is a common challenge that I think should be created. In the, and the opportunities of this uh, in the DNA process uh, should be give us the opportunity to hear those people who doesn't have the opportunity to have these voices to, to the most vulnerable people to be taken account in their needs their need, uh, in this process about the DNA uh, and also the what is the capacity needed? So uh, I think, uh, in my point of view, I think is the capacity to build for the or the training for the country that uh, will strengthen the country uh, about the human rights. So, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, allow me, colleagues, we have to close in three minutes. Uh, 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 on this session on human rights and voluntary national reviews. I believe in closing uh, 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 that the VNR is really a very important instrument and a strategic moment uh, on the progress towards the SDGs. It identifies ways how we can accelerate this progress at the country level, which is very important. I'm very delighted that I've been invited to moderate this uh, session and apologies for if there were like uh, uh, time limits and restrictions disregard. Uh, you know, all the UN development system on the ground under the leadership actually resident coordinators plays always a very important role in supporting the government and civil society organizations in the whole VNR process. The RCs, uh, RC offices, uh, UN agencies on the ground are ready there to support all stakeholders and partners, including civil society. We need to deliver a whole of society on VNRs. On behalf of the IPPN organizing team, I would like to thank the presenters, the panelists, and all participants for sharing your experiences with us today's cafe chat. I invite you to join the IPPN network to continue our conversation. You will be able to access the presentation, recording of today's session and other relevant resources on the IPPN platform through the link posted in the chat. We look forward to seeing you again at the next IPPN session in October which will focus on how to apply an intersectional approach to disability and leave no one behind in the implementation of the 2030 agenda. Thank you all and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Bye.